once again, everybody. My name is Father John Hughes, and I want to welcome you back to our third of five talks uh, in our attempt to gain a better understanding of the four major themes of the uh, biblical story, of the Old Testament biblical, biblical story that will enable us to gain a better understanding of the New Testament and enter more deeply into the whole mystery of God's great story of salvation. This third talk is uh, basic. It's entitled The Exodus and the New Exodus. However, we're going to be uh, uh, pretty much discussing uh, the old Exodus. And uh, one of the things that I want to discuss first is is what that what made the old exodus so important what was it all about and the old exodus was principally about spiritual freedom and we might ask ourselves well what is such a big deal about spiritual freedom in our own day and age, we, we generally think of freedom as being involved with economic freedom or political freedom. But what the Bible teaches us is that without spiritual freedom, we can't have economic and political freedom without a strong military. In other words, in order to attain to a strong political and economic liberty, in order to hold on to that, without spiritual freedom, we need military power. And you can see a difference here then between basically the spirit of the world and the spirit of God, or the city of man and the city of God. Okay, so the Exodus then was all about spiritual liberation. And so what this spiritual liberation then would, then what would flow from that naturally would be a political freedom as well as an economic freedom, a spirit, or a, an economic liberty and a, and a political liberty. Uh, it's just like Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of these things shall be granted you besides. And so we want to focus on this element of spiritual liberty because that is what the exodus was all about. So one of the things that is going to be able to help us to uh, enter more deeply into this, what the exodus was all about, is to look at some parallels between the creation account and the exodus account. If you remember from one of our previous talks, uh, when we were talking about Adam, we mentioned how Adam was uh, placed in the garden. We mentioned how Adam was uh, a son of God. He was created in the image of likeness of God, and so he was created as a, a firstborn son of God, and that he was also a priest and king. He was a king because he was given dominion, and he was a priest because he was placed in the garden in order to uh, work the garden and to guard the garden. And so Adam was then a firstborn son, a priest, and a king. And then another thing that we saw from uh, the creation account is that on the seventh day, God hallowed that day. And of course, we know that that word in Hebrew for hallowing was kiddoshim and it was in essence a way of saying that God married his creation on the seventh day. He married Adam and Eve and so we had this nuptial imagery in this first covenant. So we know that Adam was a firstborn son, a priest, and a king and that all of these elements had to play uh, or had a part to play in the nuptial imagery between God and his covenant with man. And then when we go to the Exodus account, we, we see then that Israel was called to be God's firstborn son as a nation. Uh, they were called to be a firstborn son and they were to be a 
royal nation of priests or to be a nation of priests and royal nation of priests which means they would be kings they would be a kingly priestly nation and as a nation they were the firstborn son of God so by looking at these parallels between the creation account and the exodus account between Adam as a firstborn son and Israel as a firstborn son, we can gather three essential truths. Okay, of course, Adam, a firstborn son, a priest and a king. Israel as a, as a firstborn son, a priest and a king. And one of these, the first essential truth would be that there is something kind of, a, <laughs> there's a certain danger involved. We could say there, there, there's a danger of death involved. Uh, first of all, second of all, there is uh, a service or a type of slavery that is involved. And then thirdly, uh, that marriage is involved. And in particular, the aspect of marriage that is, is so important, fidelity. So these three aspects of uh, death, slavery, and fidelity. Okay, so so why death? Well, of course, with regard to Adam, we saw that there was an element of death that was involved with regard to his having to stand up to the serpent in the garden. Of course, the serpent was tempting his wife Eve in the garden, and we know that Adam was by her side, in that Adam did not stand up and defend his wife, but he remained silent and let his wife fall into sin. And then of course, she led him into sin as well. So Adam did not stand up to the serpent. Now, uh, with regard to the Exodus event, we see that God released uh, Israel from the power of Egypt through 10 plagues. And the last of those 10 plagues was the death of the firstborn of man and beast. And so it was through death that Israel received its freedom. The second element is slavery. And what we see if we if we look at uh, Exodus chapter 3, chapter, what is it, 1, uh, verse 13. It says, with regard to Egypt, that Egypt made the people of Israel serve with rigor and made their lives bitter with hard service and mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they made them serve with rigor. So this word serve uh, was the same word that was used for Adam's service of God in the garden. It was the same word that was used for the priestly service for God in the temple. And then, of course, in Exodus 3, verse 12, we see that God says to, to Moses, but I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. So we have this aspect of service, or what was often, the term was often used, slavery, your servant, you're a slave. And so that we see an exchanging of of slavery between Pharaoh and God and so the question is is well you know why is it any better to be a slave of God than a slave of Pharaoh and so we want to take a look at this as the second element and then of course the third element would be with regard to uh, marriage uh, and particularly the uh, the faithfulness of of the of the spouses the fidelity of the spouses and we saw of course that adam was not faithful to god in the account of creation
And so we, we also know that Israel uh, was unable to remain faithful to God, that there was a great deal of infidelity uh, with regard to Israel's relationship with God in Exodus, and that their, their covenant went from being a, a, a marital covenant to a sovereign vassal type of covenant. So with regard to this first essential truth or element that we recognize from these parallels when we talk about death, we can ask ourselves, well, what does uh, Adam's failure to stand up to the serpent in the book of Genesis, what does that have to do with God taking the life of the firstborn son of Pharaoh in the book of Exodus? And well, the first thing that it tells us is that before original sin, before original sin, man could defend himself against the power of the evil one. He didn't do that, but he could have. He had the power to do so. After, after the fall, after original sin, as we see in Exodus, man had to be delivered out of the power power of the evil one by God himself. Man was no longer capable of saving himself, so to speak. But more importantly, what it tells us is that Adam, when he disobeyed God and ate the fruit, he basically died a supernatural death. He uh, and, and so the firstborn son of God, this priest and king, died the death. He died a supernatural death and then was no longer serving God. He was no longer the slave of God, but he became the slave of the serpent, if you will, the slave of, uh, of the demon, of the demon. Another thing that this reveals is that just as Adam refers to a man, but also Adam refers to mankind, we use the same uh, way of expressing ourselves in English. We can refer to a man, and then we can refer to man as all of humanity. So there is an individual sense and a corporate sense. Well, we can say the same thing for the firstborn. So we saw before how the firstborn is a priest and a king. So this applies to the firstborn, but also it applies on a corporate level. And we can see then in the firstborn a religious system from which flows the political power. And so by God saying that he's going to destroy the firstborn son of Pharaoh, he's saying that he's going to destroy the religious system and the political power of Egypt. And why? Because they are worshiping idols. And as we know from Deuteronomy, the fact that they were worshiping idols means that they were in truth worshiping demons. So they were under the power of, they were under demonic power, worshiping demons in the form of idols. Uh, and from this flowed their political power. So God, by destroying the firstborn son of Pharaoh, was going to take down Egyptians' religious system and their political power. And the third thing that it reveals is that there is a primordial truth with regard to humanity uh, with regard to our society, uh, um, it shows that there is a direct link between political power and religious activity, if you will, that power flows from the religious activity, for instance, worshiping idols or worshiping God, serving demons or serving God. From both of these flow uh, man's political power, but the priesthood is always first. And so we see this in, in Egypt's day, for instance, Pharaoh, uh, you know, they were worshiping idols and these idols were demons and from this flowed their political power. Uh, 
But if we take a look uh, 1,500 years later at the inscription of the Roman coins, we can see this, that the inscription on the coins were Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus, Augustus High Priest. And so Caesar, of course, we know that Augustus was considered to be a god, but also a high priest. So once again, you have this religious system from which flows the political power, the political system. And for anybody who knows anything about what's going on in our own day, we can see that this same reality exists today as well. The only difference is, is that the mask is torn off of idolatry. The mask is torn off of pagan worship. And now we see it directly as being Satanism. And then the second element that we want to take a look at is slavery. The service of God and the service of Pharaoh. Now, and again, you know, why is one any better or worse than the other? So if we go back once again to the account of creation and we see how Adam in being created was placed in the garden and he was told to work the garden and guard the guard the garden and we know that these are priestly terms they're terms for worship for sacrifice for service okay and what that tells us then that tells us something very profound about the very nature of man and that is that man was created to serve, to worship, and to sacrifice God. And the fact that that's what man was created to do means that that is where man's happiness lies. And so that means that this service of God, this worship of God, this slavery to God is actually true freedom whereas service of pharaoh or the demon or slavery to pharaoh or the demon is actually true misery and the reason why we usually fall into this misery is because of uh, the concupiscence that we talked about in the last talk this concupiscence makes the three temptations of the world uh, money sex and power as they make these three elements seem as though they are where our happiness lies and so we fall into this and it can be exciting at first but we quickly learn that it leads us into true misery and so that is what God was trying to teach us in the Exodus account, that by following our fallen nature leads us into true misery. And the one who was leading us into it is the devil through those who have the power of the spirit of the world. And so this leads us to our third and last element that we saw from these parallels between the creation account and uh, the Exodus account, and that's, that's the marital aspect. In particular, uh, fidelity. Of course, we saw then that Adam was unfaithful. We saw that Israel was unfaithful. And what we learned from the Exodus, Exodus account in the first place with regard to uh, to death is that before the fall Adam had the power to defend himself against the evil one after the fall God had to rescue man from the power of the evil one you can say the same thing with regards to fidelity even though Adam wasn't faithful to God he could have been faithful to God but after the fall man is also not capable of being faithful to God and so not only do we need God to rescue us from the power of the evil one but we also need God to give us the strength 
and empower us to be able to be faithful to him. And so because of Israel's lack of power to be able to remain faithful to God, to the covenant that God had made with them, there had to be a new exodus. And this is what the prophets started talking about. Of course, we know that Israel fell into exile, and the prophets came and they talked about there being a new exodus. Um, prophet like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they talked about a new exodus, and that there would be a new Moses uh, to lead this exodus. Although it wouldn't actually be a new Moses, it would be a Davidic figure. Uh, but there would be a new Exodus, a new, a new Moses, a new David, a new temple, a new priesthood, a new law. And this was something that we see uh, that was fulfilled in the new covenant. And this was what, what Jesus came to fulfill in the new covenant. But what we want to just kind of recognize here is all of these important allusions from the book of Exodus that help us to understand better uh, the New Testament, what Jesus fulfilled, and what, why it's so important to us, why it's so important to our freedom, and why it's so important to our happiness. And with that, I want to thank you for your time and attention, and God bless you.